Welcome to the Franciscan Spirituality Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin's What is Spirituality podcast. Your host, Steve Spildy, is the Associate Director at the Center. His guests talk about their evolving understanding of God, prayer, healing, and wholeness. Today, it is my special pleasure to welcome Trace Bell. I love listening to podcasts, and my all-time favorite is the Robcast. Trace is a regular co-host there with his father, Rob Bell. Last year, Trace and Rob changed how I see life with their four-part podcast series titled Me, We, and Everybody. In the podcast, they provide a great introduction to spiral dynamics and help me grasp an integral perspective on spirituality. And so I'm excited to welcome Trace to this podcast. Trace, I appreciated that series of me, we, and everybody so much because it helped me understand what has been happening in our politics for the last five or six years. It also helped me understand the path of spiritual growth that I've been on and the spiritual struggles I encounter with many people I meet in spiritual direction. Trace, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but for our listeners who may be unfamiliar with what we mean by spiral dynamics, how would you describe this theory? First off, I'm so honored for everything you said. It makes me so happy to hear people's response to that series. I'm honored. It's not putting me on the spot. I've I've been explaining this to in a lot of ways <laughs> to a lot of people, and I love it. I love it. I love sharing this with people. So spiral dynamics is a psychological development model that maps the evolutionary patterns of humans and individuals. So it, it models how hum, individuals psychologically develop and collective psychologically developed. And it was developed a couple of decades ago by a guy named Claire Graves and Don Beck, who are psychologists. And they found that humans over time, their value systems change as they go through these stages of growth. So this is what spiral dynamics is ultimately mapping. It's mapping that there are certain stages of growth that humans go through and groups go through as well. So it's been a really illuminating and helpful model because it allows you to see your own growth and the certain stages you went through in your own journey. It allows you to understand a lot of people are just simply acting from different stages in this model and they're acting from different perspectives. Another way people kind of describe spiral dynamics is it just, it maps the evolution of consciousness. So our consciousness increases in its ability for complexity and depth and compassion and empathy over time. And this is what spiral dynamics ultimately maps is it maps how humans grow to more whole aligned integrated individuals. The Robcast, everything is spiritual. So it always looks at things through sort of a spiritual lens. How do you connect spiral dynamics with spirituality in particular. The spiritual implications of spiral dynamics kind of like hit me in the face when I first learned the model. It describes the growth that people go through on their journeys. And you can see people grow into these higher level developments. Spirituality becomes an integral aspect of these higher levels of development. The higher levels on this model in spiral dynamics are people at these higher levels are often maturing into a deeper spirituality and taking a very spiritual perspective on things spiritual development and spiritual evolution, if you will, is kind of inherent in the design of our reality. So a model that maps this development of humans and groups is going to say a lot about the spiritual evolution of the people that it's mapping. There's a lot of spiritual implications for, I mean, one of the stages in spiral dynamics, which we teach in our class, Living the Spiral, is actually a stage that's about your deep connection to your personal connection to spirituality, your personal connection to reality itself. So there's literally a stage. There's, there's actually stages in this model that describe and articulate people's personal connection to spirituality. In those higher stages, those integrated integral perspectives, those stages are so intertwined with spirituality and it takes a very spiritual value of having compassion for everyone, understanding that people are coming from different perspectives, meeting people where they're at. The, the spiritual implications are endless. It's very fun for people to learn the model and kind of take away their own conclusions and find their own kind of ahas and insights through the model because I've watched people over time learn spiral dynamics and then take away their own insights that I didn't even get when I learned it or I didn't even realize. I would urge anyone listening to go check out the model themselves and see if they can find any spiritual implications or spirituality within it because spirituality is a language that speaks to us personally and the model speaks differently to different people and different people have different insights. And that's what's so beautiful about it is it has so many different ways to read and understand it. I would just say for people who are listening to this, 
to do yourself a favor and listen to that series. <laughs> it's me, we, and everybody. If you do a search on the Robcast, it was like last year in November. You and Rob just do such a great job of making it accessible. It's complex material, but yet it's very understandable. I could see anyone understanding it, especially the way you presented it. So I just encourage people to listen to that, and then you'll end up wanting to read more and... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That was our goal when we recorded it as we, we had this model. My dad's been teaching spiral dynamics for over a decade. And he was like, okay, so what form am I meant to teach this in? Is it supposed to be a video series? Is it supposed to be a book? And then he was like, let's actually do, let's do a podcast series. He's like, Trace, will you join me for this podcast series? Because him and I were talking about it. Um, and I had learned it a year prior. And then I was like, yeah, let's do a podcast series. And we just, we sat down and we're like, how can we do this in our Trace and Rob language the best? that like connects with the most amount of people and is the most accessible that also makes them want to learn more. So to, so to hear that that had that effect on people just makes me so happy. So thank you. You are relatively young. You're in your mid twenties, correct? Yep. Say a bit about your spiritual journey and how the spiral dynamics might fit into that for you. The first time my dad sat down and taught me spiral dynamics, it was a very Rob Bell moment. He sat, sat down at the kitchen counter with two big blank sheets of white paper with a marker. And I was like, okay, this is going to be a, be a Rob Bell moment here. He was like, I'm going to teach you spiral dynamics. And then just boom, just wrote it out on two big blank white sheets of paper and just wrote it out in, in his writing. And it was just beautiful. And I had this whole model in front of me. And then I ended up actually hanging it in my bedroom because it was kind of like an awesome kind of like a souvenir almost, like memorabilia. <laughs> um, when I first learned Spiral Dynamics, um, it really connected a lot of, it really put language and a framework to a lot of the things I had experienced. So I grew up with my parents starting a massive mega church in West Michigan. My dad was, was teaching at the church. My parents were very involved with the church and that was kind of their, their project. So my dad was very involved in the Christian world. People kind of are surprised when they, they hear me say this, but I just never really connected with any sort of organized religious structure when I was younger. I just never felt like a deep connection to Christianity, and I didn't really feel a deep connection to the church or what my parents were doing. And my parents kind of kept the kids separate from the church a little bit. Like they didn't involve us very much in the church life. I didn't really have a um, connection to any sort of religious structure or consider myself religious at all. But I had like, a, as a kid, I had a deep metaphysical kind of wonder about the universe and a deep sort of wonder and awe about the universe and a deep wonder and awe about consciousness. So I had this, I, I say that everyone has their own doorway into spirituality, which is everyone has their own kind of way that they came into spirituality and way that the universe kind of ushered them into a deeper relationship with God, source, spirit, whatever word you want to call it. And to me, that felt like my doorway. My doorway wasn't organized religion. My doorway was just this deep kind of yearning to connect with reality and to connect and, and understand who I am and understand the interconnectedness of everything. So my growth throughout the years, it was just kind of following this thread of just deep wonder. And, and as a kid, I was reading about consciousness and I was reading about different kinds of religions. And I was just reading a bunch of things to kind of satisfy this, this uh, yearning and this wonder and awe. And so my spiritual journey has been reintegrating and, and following that childlike kind of wonder and awe and exploring that. So I just kind of had a deep kind of connection to spirituality and this deep spiritual connection. Now, when I learned spiral dynamics, I could see the reason it was so illuminating for me on my own personal journey is that I could actually see myself going through all those stages throughout my life as I, I could actually see myself. There's a stage called orange, which is very logic oriented and very associated with the rational mind. And when I learned the spiral dynamics, I was like, oh, I remember when I went through my orange phase. And then there's a stage called green, which is all about seeing everyone as equal and having compassion and love for everyone. I was like, oh, I remember when I went through my green phase. So I could actually see all of these stages of consciousness within myself and within my own growth journey. And it wasn't like just stages of consciousness that I had sort of gone through and didn't have any access to. It was all stages of consciousness that were, because I had gone through them, they were all accessible and lived within me. My journey has been kind of interesting. I, I mean, it's a huge paradox that my dad was, you know, a big figure in the Christian world and started this massive mega church, but then his firstborn son never considered himself Christian. I mean, it's like totally one of the it's totally one of the, the paradoxes of my journey that I kind of just laugh at and just kind of love. Like, it's just totally weird and totally great at the same time. So uh, I'm so grateful for my parents that they allowed me to have the environment to just have my own spirituality and have my own connection and not push anything on me. That was kind of my journey in a nutshell, if I could kind of condense it down. Well, one of the reasons I'm excited to talk to you is one is I just find you incredibly interesting. I've taken the living, the, the spiral class. It was a great experience. I know you're going to offer it again. I hope people will sign up for it. 
I have a sense that you really do represent your generation well. I mean, I think you were reading, reading like you're saying, you were curious, you're doing a lot of reading, probably extraordinary. I don't think most people your age were reading those, some of the same sort of books that you were reading. But yet, I think that sense of your parents were very involved in leading this mega church, very religious at one point. That I think is common to a lot of people. Maybe the parents' generation would really identify as being very religious. And you are deeply spiritual, but that label doesn't really fit for you. I think for a lot of people of your generation, it's not that you're not spiritual, it's just you practice it in a different way. The word God means something different to people of your generation than Mm. maybe of my generation or your grandparents' generation. You think that's fair? Absolutely. I think you're 100% spot on. I think that a lot of people of the older generations, their doorway into all of this was organized religion. Like my parents, for example, their doorway into their spirituality was organized religion. They came up in the organized Christian structure. My parents came up, they were born and raised in that. That was all they knew. They, they, they even say they use that same language. They're like, yeah, that was our doorway. Our doorway was organized religion. As the interest in organized religion declines over time, you now have a new generation, my generation being born into families where the kind of intensity and the focus on that organized religion isn't as intense as it was for your generation and the older generations. So now you have people of my generation, there still is that natural human yearning to connect with something larger than ourselves, that natural yearning to connect spiritually and have a deep sort of connection to reality and find out what this all is for, to connect with something larger than just the ego and the individual self. So people of my generation are finding different doorways because that organized religion doorway just isn't as prominent as it used to be. So I love the different creative ways that people are finding their doorway. So like for me, it was a fascination with the metaphysical nature of reality itself. And that was my doorway. For other people, it's like I see people are really interested in astrology, people are really interested in energy. You just see people interested in all the expansive personal aspects of spirituality, but just not interested in any of the kind of structural system aspects of religion, I think. And that's what I see really with my generation. One of the reasons I think I'm finding spiral dynamics and integral spirituality to be so fascinating is my upbringing. If you didn't enter this doorway, that was the only doorway to spirituality where this really explains the whole concept that there may be many doorways, but what's the deeper activity going on beyond? I really see it as a map. It helps me see reality, this map. People of my generation may look at people of your generation who go through different doorways and say, well, they're not interested in spirituality, but that's, it's missing the point. I have seen that from people in the older generation. I think that's just an incredibly limiting and narrow view of spirituality. I think If your definition of spirituality is that it's supposed to look one right certain way, I think that's a very limiting way. And that that to me is the big difference between a lot of religion and spirituality is religion is the word to kind of describe the kind of systems and structures around a certain kind of belief system or certain orientation towards life. And there's healthy religions and then there's unhealthy religions too. There's a scale of how healthy a religion can be and how unhealthy a religion can be. Some people kind of just use religion in a very kind of negative way, like it's all negative. And I don't think that's fair. It varies how there's beautiful, healthy religions, then there's unhealthy religions that really create that kind of me, us versus them paradigm, where it's like, you're either with us or you're against us. You're the one of the believers, you're one of the non-believers. It kind of varies in health. And I I think there's a lot of beautiful, healthy religions. But to, to me, the big difference between religion and spirituality is spirituality is just about that personal connection, that direct connection from me to reality. And when I say reality, again, I mean like God, source, spirit, uh, consciousness, whatever word you want to give it. But the reason a lot of people say I'm spiritual, but not religious is because they they say, I just am only interested in my own personal connection to this without the kind of intermediary and kind of the system and structural aspects of religion. And the beautiful thing about spirituality is spirituality integrates all of the religions. Spirituality sees what all these religions were pointing to and the truth underlying all these religions. So that to me is the really beautiful and expansive part of spirituality and has been my journey has been actually reclaiming a love for religion because I didn't really growing up, I didn't really have a connection with religion. But when I grew into my more mature spirituality, I was able to have this love for all these different kinds of religions because I was able to see 
the truth in the heart of what they were pointing to. So I was able to see what Jesus was pointing to and, and how brilliant of a teacher Jesus was. I was able to see, take the truths of the Eastern spirituality, like the Bhagavad Gita and those kind of books. Like I was able to see the truths that, at, that they were pointing to. And I was able to see how they kind of overlapped and what they were all pointing to. And that was really was beautiful to me. So spirituality is so much more expansive than just looking one certain way. Um, and it integrates all of it. One of the things I'm interested to hear from you though, is someone who comes from a younger generation who didn't come through the doorway of traditional religion. But yet, I'm interested to hear from your perspective how you understand some of these words. So you've already kind of referenced, like the word God, some of the ways that are meaningful for you, you know, spirit, source, the universe, what are some other ways that you understand what people label as God? That's a great question. Yeah. The word God, I would say is the, the underlying essence behind everything. I would say it's the, there's a the line that all names are equally inappropriate. We can't actually ever describe, we can't ever actually describe God. God is completely ineffable, indescribable, but the, so the best we can do is try to be skillful as possible with the words. And I would say that God is the, the underlying essence of everything. It's the oneness behind all distinctions. It's the very isness of existence itself and life itself. So that's that, that's the best I could describe it. Similarly, some other words. How would you define the word prayer? Prayer is great. Prayer is a great word. Um, I would go to this concept of you can interact with God in first person, second person, and third person. I'll start with third person. Third person interacting with God is speaking of, of God as like an it, like God is here right now in this moment. It's speaking of God as like an it. First person speaking to God is speaking the nature of myself and the nature of God are not different. If God is the underlying essence of everything, then God is the essential identity of what I am. My true nature is God. It's the underlying essence. Now, second person interacting with God is talking to God like a you. And this is where I would say prayer comes in. So prayer is just one form of communicating with God. And it's it, no way of communicating is better or worse. An actual an integral perspective on spirituality uses this first person, second person, third person. So it speaks with the knowing that I am not different from God, but also can engage in prayer it's speaking to God as a you. God, I'm praying to you like in the form of a prayer. And then third person right here, God is present in this conversation that Steve and I are having. So to me, prayer is just one of the ways of communicating with God that makes up a kind of integral perspective. Some other words associated with religion, but also important to spirituality would be faith. From an uh, integral perspective, how would you define the word faith? When I hear the word faith, what comes up for me is living with the conviction that life is being done for us rather than life happening to us. So that's just my mm. personal, that's my personal definition of faith. I, I feel like I've had faith my whole life, which, which is as a kid, I had this deep intuition and kind of just deep knowing in myself. And it was like a knowing that went beyond just the kind of knowing that the mind can do. It was this like deep knowing that sat in the heart that this whole life experience, this whole reality is actually being done for us. It's being done for us to, to learn and to grow. It's being done for God to experience itself. And that's a much different perspective than be, viewing life being done to us, which is a lot of what, what a lot of people view is this mm -hmm. kind of victimized kind of state of life is constantly happening to me. And that's what the state that a lot of people that have no kind of spiritual connection are in is they're just kind of lost in this kind of maze of life of just like, I'm just this human born to this world and things are happening to me and I'm a victim to these things. And to me, faith is believing, no, this life is actually being done for me rather than being done to me. That's what faith means to me. I like how you describe in living the spiral, kind of the unhealthy aspect of each stage and also the healthy aspect or the <laughs> the unhealthy aspect or the gift of each phase. And so as I listen to that, I'm thinking about like the purple phase, which has kind of this God's, this mysterious figure that will, you know, strike me with lightning if I don't do the right thing. That's kind of an unhealthy phase, but yet a healthy phase is, yeah, I, I don't know how to describe it, but I think there's something out there. And I think it wants me to grow. It wants me to be healthy. It wants me to succeed. So how do I connect with that? True faith is that when that conviction is so strong that even when negative things happen in your life, you're still being seeing them as being done for you and for your growth and for your learning. A lot of people 
when bad things happen in their life. And this is a, it's very hard. I mean, we all fall into even, even the most spiritually evolved people fall into this kind of trap of like, when, when hard things happen, it feels like we're kind of victimized by those things. And like, you know, life is against us in some way, but to have that, have such a strong faith that even the points in life and when you're suffering, you're still viewing them in this larger perspective that they're ultimately being done for you to grow and for you to learn and, and seeing that oftentimes we actually learn by contracts. We actually learn and grow by the hard moments and the moments we suffer just as much as the moments that are great. And, and oftentimes we actually learn more by the moments that we suffer. So it's just seeing, it's integrating life into this larger perspective of seeing it being done for us. It's not just about us. It's about a larger perspective. So it's not mm. just about what's good for me, but good for my neighbor. And then what I mean by my neighbor is not only the person living next door, but the person who might have a different skin color or might have a different sexual identity. That that same sense of spirit is for us. It's for all of us. And sometimes the things that might not seem good for me, it's like, yeah, because it's working for all of us. I think that's one of the aspects that I would say people who identify as religious looking at people who are spiritual but not religious can be judgmental at times it's like Mm -hmm. well you have to be good to be a good person you have to be religious but i know you to be a good person i think you have a strong sense of values a strong sense of commitment to the larger world commitment goes well beyond yourself i think that's common among many of your generation how would you respond to that? I actually remember as a young kid, my parents purposely would expose us to people that weren't religious and people outside the Christian tradition. Because just as, as parents, they wanted us to experience like a diversity of people. They didn't want us to experience only people that identified uh, as being Christians. And I remember just as a young kid realizing a lot of the people I met that didn't associate with any particular religion were great people, good people with good morals, good hearts, great orientations towards life and just very loving people. So that idea that you had to be a part of a certain religion to be a good person or you had to was just shattered for me as a, as a kid. I saw right through that. I think the idea that you have to be part of a religion to be a good person is a very, very limiting and narrow idea. And I think that there's tons of people of my generation, of all generations that aren't, have done amazing work with such good heart and are often sometimes more loving than people of certain religions, you know, like it doesn't, it's not about what religion you're a part of. It's about actually how much love you're letting into your heart and how much you're taking the invitation from the universe every day to constantly love and be more inclusive and have more compassion and more empathy. And whatever way that happens is whatever way works best for people. Um, But yeah, I definitely see it in my generation. A lot of my generation doesn't associate with particular religion. And there's still great, fantastic people who are so loving and so compassionate and just doing amazing work in the world. That might be a a new definition for me of faith. It's based on how much love you let into your heart. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Another definition. How would you define a good person? We've been talking about good people. What makes a person good? I think how loving they are. I think humans can really act from two places. If, you, if we if we try to narrow it down as much as possible, humans can act from two places. They can act from fear or they can act from love. Our, our world operates on a lot of fear. Our, we, we look at the wars, the conflicts, the wealth inequality. A lot of mo- actions are motivated by the idea that there's a scarce amount of resources. So it's motivated by scarcity. It's motivated by this. I'm trying to ensure my own survival. So if that's at the detriment to others, I don't care because it's just trying to ensure my own survival. So a lot of actions are being done from fear. The challenge in life is to to how much can you overcome? How much can you see through that fear and live from love? People that are are good people and that I would describe as good people are people that have are really living from their hearts and living from that love and and consciously embodying as much love as possible because love is the actual uh, I call it a capital L love which is the, the capital L love is the actual form of if you, I mean, God doesn't really have a form exactly, but, but it's the actual, how I understand it is capital L love is synonymous with God. It's, it's pure love itself. So the more we're living like God is the more we're being loving and the more we're letting love into our hearts and the more we're embodying that love. So a spiritual journey to me is just, it's a journey of embodying more love and just being more love. So yeah, I think that's the I think that's how I describe a good person is how how loving they are and how much they're living from their hearts and how much they're living from that love in their hearts. How common would you say that definition is among people of your generation? 
or at least your friends, the people you hang out with? To tell you the truth, I don't have a lot of friends my age that talk about this. I've always connected more with, with adults and my, my best friends growing up were uh, my parents' friends and my, my parents have always been my best friends. Now my girlfriend is, is much older than me. I would be lying if I said that I knew a lot of people my age that talked about this kind of stuff. The great thing about this work that I've been doing is I have met younger people who have been into this. So through this work, I have met younger people that are into this, but in my personal life, I don't really have friends my age that are um, into this. I have a, I have a friend in his mid thirties, my best friend in his mid thirties, who's into this, but, a, but he's technically a millennial and I'm Gen Z. I, I assume a lot of them are out there in my generation, but I haven't really found them. That's one of my concerns looking at spiral dynamics is the blue energy, which you describe it better than I do. But the blue energy is like when people join a church, a, a community, it's like, hey, these are my people. And so if I'm sick, these are the people who are going to care and bring over food to our house. Or if there's a death in the family, they're the ones who are going to call and, and provide support. And that blue energy is really powerful. And that's one of the reasons why I think people of my generation, if they would move, it was important to join a church because I need to have a group of my people. As the younger generations, that's not as important. Where do people find that blue energy though? Where do they find that sort of support when they are going through a tough time and there's sickness, when I need help babysitting, when I need you know, someone to cry at my funeral, whatever. I mean, um, where do people find that blue energy? I think you're naming one of the, the top challenges of my generation. And I, I know from being at UCLA, I was shocked at how little community was valued at UCLA and the kind of bl those blue aspects of community and having that kind of support system and having others that were there and, and kind of having like your own family, like if people took care of each other, which is these beautiful aspects of stage blue, which is the fourth stage in spiral dynamics. I think, honestly, I think that my generation because we're at this weird point where we're a lot of my generation is moving away from organized religion. There aren't a lot of communities based on kind of a spirituality without religion. That's something that's missing, I think, for my generation in a lot of ways. So I think one of the challenges for my generation is to be to cultivate that and to build communities and to build those healthy aspects of blue in these other areas. So I know for, for my own personal uh, experience in college, I was really shocked by how little those blue aspects were there and how it kind of in college, it just felt like every person for himself. And there wasn't really a lot of kind of healthy blue. And I, I would hear other people, like my parents would describe their college experience. And it sounded like there was a ton of healthy blue. Like it felt like everyone was kind of on the same page and everyone that was there to kind of support each other. And it was this kind of like camaraderie. So I didn't feel that. So I see that in my generation of like, that's something that's missing in a lot of ways. There's some really beautiful aspects of church and, and religion and that, that kind of community that I think my generation is missing. And I think that, that our challenge is going to be how we build that and how we cultivate that. But it's, it's, it's tricky and it's a challenge. Yeah, that's one of the things I get excited about you because I think you are doing it like that group that we did living the spiral as an example of creating that sort of blue group but yet to be talking about deeper issues. And so what's it all mean? What's it all about? Great model. And I, I think that sort of community could appeal to people of any generation. My hope with my work is that when I create a space, you know, whatever age people are at is perfect. My, my hope is that I'll start attracting younger people and start having different pockets of people that are looking for certain things. So I feel like I'm, I'm just beginning. I'm just getting started at, at putting my voice. It's also harder too, because of the environment we're in right now with COVID. People are connecting much more on Zoom and online. It's a definitely a different kind of world. So it's going to be really fascinating to see this challenge that my generation has and also the circumstances that we're in. I think the next decade, and it's going to be fascinating to see the different ways that this stuff changes and evolves. I think there's been problems that existed for a long time that people just didn't notice until COVID came along. <laughs> Like yeah. this, this, this is not working. We need to find something new. And that sense of being in community is part of it. You know, people are just desperate to connect. I think they've probably been desperate to connect for a long time, but they're even more desperate now. I'm hopeful that new communities will come out of this. Where do you find hope looking forward? Through the people that I work with and through the people that I meet through this work, people like yourself, people that I've met living the spiral, people that have come to my one-on-one -on -one sessions, people that have emailed me. I've watched that through my dad too, just watching the people that would come to my dad's events and the people that would interact with my dad. Obviously there's a ton, a ton of crossover. A lot of people are coming to me through my dad. The people and the work that they're doing and the teachers and people starting nonprofits and people working at 
um, and spiritual centers and teaching spirituality. It's like the amount of amazing people who are doing amazing work in the world. You know, we have this model of scarlet dynamics and we talk about consciousness evolution and consciousness increasing. And then you actually meet people in real life that are actually enacting that and actually raising consciousness in their community and actually growing themselves. And it's like, it gets me just so energized because it's like, you can talk about this stuff, but when you actually meet the people that are actually on the ground doing it, it just gives them like a different level of excitement and hope. Just all the stuff that I talk about, Sparla Dynamics, consciousness, um, all of it has this underlying pattern that the world moves towards evolution and consciousness and have an upward trajectory moving towards the ability for more intricacy, complexity, depth, compassion, love. So people kind of do that intellectual nihilist thing where people are like, oh, the world's going to crap. Everyone's going crazy. But it's like, if we actually look at the research and the data and the statistics, and we actually look at the work people are doing, no, things are getting better and the world is getting better. It might not always seem like it. And we, there might be kind of minor setbacks, but humans are, are growing in their ability to love. Like if you look back only a couple hundred years ago, there were horrible atrocities that were committing that are outlawed today. Progress happens over time. There's an upward trajectory. So to me, it's like, if I can, if I can sink into that and have that kind of orientation towards life, it just gives me incredible hope. And then it's only just ex- exemplified by the just incredible people that I'm meeting who are actually enacting the work. So that's really what gives me the most hope is just how many amazing people there are out there that I get to interact with and meet. If you have any questions about any of the programs that they offer at the Franciscan Spirituality Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin, we invite you to call us at 608-791-5295. That's 608-791-5295. You can also visit our website at www.fscenter.org. www.fscenter.org. Thank you for listening.